This episode is brought to you by Vital Farms. Isn't it bullshit to have to question where your food comes from? At Vital Farms, you can trace your pasture-raised eggs all the way back to the source, the pasture. On the side of each pasture-raised carton of eggs, you'll find the name of the farm where your eggs were laid. And when you look the farm up on their website, you'll get a peek at all the sunshine, fresh air, and open space the hens enjoy. Learn more and find out where to buy them at vitalfarms.com. Vital Farms, keeping it bullshit free. Reboot your credit card with Apple Card, the credit card created by Apple. It gives you unlimited daily cash back that you can now choose to grow in a high-yield savings account that's built right into the Wallet app. Apply for Apple Card now in the Wallet app on iPhone and start growing your daily cash with savings today. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility requirements. Savings accounts provided by Goldman Sachs Bank USA. Member FDIC. Terms apply. It's time to say goodbye to hold music and say hello to fast customer support with Service Cloud. With trusted AI and data working together, you can skip long wait times and deliver efficient, personalized service right away. All while keeping support costs low and more customers happy. Reimagine your customer support with the number one AI CRM for service. Learn what's possible at salesforce.com slash products slash service. This episode is brought to you by Clavio, the platform that powers smarter digital relationships. With Clavio, you can activate all your customer data in real time. Connect seamlessly with your customers across all channels. Guide your marketing strategy with AI-powered insights, recommendations, and automated assistance. Deliver experiences that feel individually designed at scale and grow your business faster. Power smarter digital relationships with Klaviyo. Learn more at klaviyo.com slash Spotify. That's K-L-A-V-I-Y-O dot com slash Spotify. I'm Jason Palmer, one of the hosts of The Intelligence, The Economist's daily current affairs podcast. The Economist's award-winning shows make sense of what matters, from our special series on China's president to our weekly podcasts on business, technology, and American politics. Our journalists provide fair, in-depth reporting on the events shaping the world. Search for Economist Podcasts Plus and sign up to our free one-month trial. Welcome to the HCI family of podcasts, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We share our own original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. Join us for practitioner-oriented content around all things leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with the HCI family of podcasts. Welcome to the podcast. In this podcast episode, I talk with Kimberly Gerber about cultivating a high-performing team culture. Kimberly Gerber, welcome to the conversation today. Oh, thank you so much, John. I'm happy to be here. It is a pleasure to be with you. You're joining us from Irvine, California. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about cultivating a high-performing team culture. Uh, I love the idea of cultivation generally. I love high performance. I love teams. I love culture. So you combine all that together, it gets a really great conversation. I think it'll be a lot of fun. As we get started, I wanted to share Kimberly's bio with everybody. Kimberly Gerber is the founder of Accelerate, an innovative leadership development firm specializing in coaching and training executives and their teams. For 30 plus years, Kimberly has helped transform the impact of more than 1,700 leaders across industry leading companies, including Verizon, uh, Blizzard, UCLA, Whirlpool, and many others. The creator of several innovative leadership development programs, Kimberly helps executives create strategic vision, build strong cultures, elevate leadership presence, and finesse communication to strengthen their impact on teams and organizations. Now, I could say a whole lot more, but I'm going to pause there. Kimberly, anything you would like to highlight from your own background or personal context before we dive on it? Sure. I I think that um, just one thing, really, and that is that before I started accelerating doing all of this work, the, the, I was an executive myself. I was I worked in Fortune 500 companies in marketing as a marketing director, and what I just being a student of what motivates people from a consumer 
perspective. It really yeah. got me, I was really intrigued about what made leaders, you know, kind of the difference between a poor leader, a, a medium, like kind of a mid leader and a great leader. And it really all came down to communication, which of course, you know, as a marketing person is something that, you know, is near and dear. And so a lot of the things that we teach and train and coach leaders around really comes from that, that perspective of um, how do you get people to do things? How do you get a team to come together? How do you get people to want to follow you? And it's really all through that lens of marketing and communication. Yeah. Well, wonderful. Thank you for that background and, and your executive experience, as well as your mm -hmm. consulting and, and coaching experience is tremendous. And I really appreciate you taking your time uh, out of your busy day to share your insights with me and my audience. Now let's dive right on in um, to this idea of cultivating high-performing team culture. Um, I mean, on the face of it, it sounds awesome. Like, I, I don't think anyone would disagree with this notion that, yes, we want to have high performance. We want to have a really healthy dynamic uh, culture, uh, recognition that it doesn't just happen. Like you have to do things to develop it, to maintain it, to sustain it. Um, what do you mean, you know, just as a way of framing out as we start the episode, what do you mean, you know, by this idea of cultivating a high performing team culture? What I, when I write that and say that and speak to that, what I'm talking about is when a group of people come together with a common purpose and actually can make decisions together, execute together in a way that serves not just an individual group or, you know, line of the business, but the whole business. And to do so in a way, not where, I mean, it's awesome if ever, there's a lot of camaraderie and everyone feels friendly towards one another, but that's not the real essence of it. It's where people feel like they're coming to, together to work together for common purpose and they actually do whatever it takes not just the fun stuff and you know not just kind of going through the checklist but really working the business together yeah wonderful very good so as we dive into this topic more in depth um can, what, what would you say would be some of those first steps in this cultivation process uh, again I guess, assuming perhaps even before we start the cultivation that we have a clear understanding of what our core objectives are and yeah. what high performance even means to yeah. us, because I think that's an assumption that's probably a faulty assumption because many organizations don't even have that, right? Like they don't mm -hmm. understand that piece. Yeah. Um, but for the sake of the conversation, let's assume for a moment that we do understand that. Um, how do you start the process of cultivation? You know, I, I think the process starts with a charter. Um, and I think that most leaders don't know how to do a team charter or even mm -hmm. that they exist and that they should do one. Uh, and so that's something that we're, you know, we, we work with a lot of teams on the chartering process and, you know, you can do a big chartering process and you can also do an informal kind of build as you go chartering process, but the, 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 the important part is to be intentional about it. So a team leader, whether they're an executive leading a high, you know, high performing team with, you know, a lot of impact or just a, a new team leader, someone who maybe has, you know, two, three, four people for the first time, uh, taking the time to think about not just how am I going to lead the individuals on this team, but how, what's the remit of the team itself? What, what is it that we are supposed to do? What's our purpose? And then starting from there. So we have a chartering process that we use kind of just to make it easy to mm -hmm. really make sure that as a leader, you're thinking about all the things you need to think about. You mentioned some of them already. You know, what's the purpose of the team? Um, who's on the team and why are they there? Uh, what are the, you know, what are the synergies of the team? I think a lot of times what I see when teams are kind of, not functioning at an optimal, you know, in an optimal way is that you have a leader who may be very good at leading people, but they're leading mm -hmm. one to one. And yeah, sure. They bring them together in a team meeting and sure they do some, some things together, but they're not actually harnessing the brain power of the team to work together to solve problems. It's we come, we do a status report. Everyone's individually leading their functions or their projects, 
but we're not working together. And I think it does take some intentionality. So the chartering process is where I always recommend people start so that the team can kind of come together, work together to figure out how they're going to, what their purpose is as a group, and then how they're going to work together. So it becomes a team building, but it also lays yeah. down the foundation of how we're going to do this. Yeah, I love that. Um, so I, I'm a university professor in addition to the consulting work that I do. Uh-huh. And in my courses, you know, I'm teaching organizational development, change management, HR, these yeah. sorts of courses. We do lots of team-based learning, um, uh, applied projects, et cetera. And that's exactly the first thing we do. You know, yeah. most students don't like working in teams. Um, most students have had bad experiences working on group projects. Yeah. Uh, and and so they come with a lot of resistance. They have a lot of baggage, usually of past bad experiences. And, and I try to explain like, no, you can do this. Well, it can be functional. It can be effective. It can be a good experience. Like you actually can come away from this, like having being energized and excited about what you've done with your team. Yeah. Um, and, and the foundation of all of that, the very first thing I have these teams do is to put together a team charter. Um, exactly the the points that you were talking about. Now, this isn't a, you know, I'm, I'm sharing, you know, what I do in a classroom setting in a sure. university space. Um, but my point is it applies in both places. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it really applies anytime you get groups of people together to try to accomplish something. <laughs> yep. And Absolutely. how often, how often are we just not even on the same starting page? Like we we're not communicating in a way that people can even hear or understand each other. So it's no wonder that, you know, teams aren't always very effective or why they don't perform at the, the level they want to uh, yeah. you have different styles. You have different uh, approaches, personalities, you have different experiences and backgrounds, and it doesn't mm-hmm. just magically happen. Usually uh, that a team's just going to magically come together, be cohesive and work well. You have to like yeah. structure it. You have to scaffold it and you have to put intentionality behind it so that you can make sure that you can grow together. And that's yeah. what the charter provides a foundation for. Absolutely. One of my favorite parts of doing a charter, I, different people call it different things, but it's the road rules process hmm. because, um, and that is where, you know, the, the group comes together and basically says, what are the behaviors, what's important to us individually, and what are the behaviors that we all agree to that we're going to, when we work with this team, we're going to abide. And, you know, some of the th- some of the reasons people don't like to work together and, and, you know, there's dysfunction on a team is because we are all very different. And what's what we value, how we like to approach our work is going to be different. And yet, if it's not on the table, if it's not stated, people don't know. And so we're we run the risk of um, missing expectation or, you know, having our own expectations you know, not met because we haven't clarified what's really important to us. So we call it road rules where, you know, you go through and you build a short but important list of what yeah. commitments you're going to make. And it's such a powerful, like, aha process for the people on the team, like, oh, this is what's important. And then as you're going through your work, you know, you refer back to that. It's like, okay, so, you know, some things are as mundane as, you know, we're going to, we're going to be on time. We're going to commit to be on time for things. We're going to commit not to cancel meetings, you know, just the, the nitty gritty things of how you do the work and how you behave can be really powerful to set that stage right up front. Yeah. I love it. And, and, and a piece of this, you know, as you're trying to cultivate, um, that means, you know, think about cultivation, cultivation Mm -hmm. in terms of a garden, right? You're, you're, you're like literally uh, planting the seeds, you're, you're, um, tilling the earth, you're watering, yeah. you're fertilizing, you're doing all these things, right? So that metaphor applying into the workplace or in a classroom setting where you're doing teamwork or even at home, um, it means it takes work. It, it, it takes proactive effort to yeah. help these things, um, be effective. Now, taking even a step back from that, I suppose we could also talk a little bit about, um, the talent within the team. So Mm -hmm. how do you go about identifying the needs of the team in terms of skill sets, competencies, capabilities? How do you go out and find and recruit and bring in and then nurture that talent within the team? Uh, Any thoughts on how that fits into this idea of cultivating high-performing team cultures? Sure. So as part of the process, I think it's important to understand who people are. And so very commonly used, you know, uh, personality, you know, talent development tools, whether it's a 
MBTI or Strengths Finders or a DISC, those are great exercises, not just for team building, because obviously they're great. You know, you get to know one another, you get to kind of explore yourself and explore others, but they're also really powerful for helping a team see who's likely to be talented in some general areas and in some general ways. And I think that teams that are balanced, you know, have, have, you know, represent many styles mm -hmm. are going to be ultimately a lot more high performing than those that might cluster a lot of people who are very similar. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, it, initially it can be very comfortable to hang around with, you know, and, yeah. to, and to work with people who are very similar to us, but then we're going to be missing things. So for example, you know, you, you may have a, a group of people that, you know, you've got some strategists on there, people who are naturally pushing the envelope, thinking big picture, figuring out kind of like, where should we go? What, you know, and how to, how to block and tackle, how to get rid of some of the obstacles. But if you don't have planners on your team, if you don't have people who are willing to get into the details on your team, execution is going to be really hard for a group like that. So when you talk about talent, like one of the things that, that I always encourage leaders to do is to figure out what are the planning talents you have on your team? What are the creative and ideation talents? And then when people are working on projects, whether it's like a team project or even like an individual, make sure you're cross pollinating those people to be working together, even if it's just eyes on somebody else's work, just to make sure. And this is where I, to me, I think that the real synergy and, and power of teams comes together is when a team, uh, le any leader on a team or any person on a team is willing to say, I need this person over here to help me with my project because they're better at that than I am. Mm. There's going to be this thing missing if I don't have this other person kind of helping me with my project. And you know when you've got a team that's hit the high performing stage, when they come to the table and they bring people into the work that they and their groups are responsible for from across the team, or they throw things out and they say, hey, this is where we're at, we're stuck, who can help me solve this problem? Because that is risky and it, it signifies that you've created a psychologically safe environment for a team mm -hmm. to actually put themselves out there and say, hey, the, the people at this table might see something I missed, or they might be better at something than I am. And when you can do that, and when people all around the table are doing that with their work, you are going to get a better lens on the business. You're going to have better decisions, and people are going to ultimately enjoy their work a whole lot more. Yeah, for sure. And I literally, before talking with you, um, was at a conflict resolution workshop, ah. um, which was super interesting. Uh, lots of really great things were shared, uh, but I couldn't help, you know, it, the whole time it was like, how can I proactively approach as a leader? And the whole time, and I, I didn't want to derail the speaker or anything to get them off of, you know, their core points because, uh, you know, they had their core objectives. But the, one of the thoughts I had um, that was kind of underlying how I was responding to a lot of what was being shared was, you know, what are the strategies? It's one thing for me as a leader to proactively think, okay, what are the high, the, the, the healthy ways to approach conflict, mm -hmm. um, you know, for, with emotional intelligence, creating psychological safety, doing it in a way that's going to maximize performance. It's one thing for me to recognize some of those things and to try to do them proactively, uh, create a good a dynamic for my team. But we've all been there where we've reported to people who don't get it or don't understand yeah. it or don't have the skill sets or ability to do it. Yep. Um, and and there's a power differential. And so, you know, you're trying to resolve conflicts within your team, but maybe you're the team member and the the team lead is the one causing the problems. Um, you know, any thoughts on, on ge general strategies, how we could go about uh, tackling that? Mm -hmm. um, because a high performing team, they're going to need to work well together. Um, but if there is, is some sort of hierarchical power differential, there also has to be a way to navigate that as well. Yeah. So um, you put a lot out there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so part of my background that I didn't mention is I'm a certified mediator. And that's um, something that I, I do um, I got the certification because I found myself doing a lot of mediation with teams and felt like that was something that was, it's really important and it's tricky to, mm -hmm. to help people navigate when they're entrenched. Um, and so 
one of the things that I learned and, and I, and it's, you know, you think about human nature, what causes conflict is a, a sense of a lack of safety. Um, you know, an imbalance, you talked about a difference in, in the power, you know, the power dynamic. When people feel heard, that's the first step. And um, I love the idea of granting legitimacy. And so if there's conflict on a team, now let's assume it's not with the team leader, because that's actually a lot trickier when the team leader is part of the of the mm. conflict. So hold that off for a second. But if, if a team leader recognizes that there's conflict on their team, not ignoring it is the first step. Conflict rarely resolves itself, and it often needs a third party to come in and to and to help bring it together. Now that third party doesn't have to be a mediator; they can be another team member or the team leader. But having allowing each party that is in conflict to vocalize and to authentically be heard—that's mm -hmm. the building block. Like that's the the first place to start with um, with addressing team conflict. One of the things, sorry, I'm gonna cough. <clears throat> One of the things that if I'm working with um, with people who are in conflict, whether it's like two groups or two individuals or three individuals, is a lot of times I'll work one-on-one -on -one to hear them out, figure out mm. really what's going on, and then be able to construct a conversation, a group conversation, so that um, you can make sure that everyone's heard in the way that they need to be heard. Once you've got some some dialogue going, uh, what I love to do with people then is put them into a project together. Mm. Because a lot of times we get into conflict because the way we approach things or what we're valuing is different, not worse, not better or worse, just different. And so if we can acknowledge that, see the value, grant some legitimacy, and then actually see how it works. That has been proven very powerful, a very powerful way to solve conflict on teams. Yeah. Well, and I think of some of my own experiences with conflict mm -hmm. um, or where there's been some professional frustrations or, you know, I, I'm an annoyed or even resentful with somebody. Um, typically, I, ha I am more likely to have those feelings if I don't have as much personal understanding or interaction with the person. And yeah. so once I for whatever reason, if that um, is provided me, if I now have the opportunity to work more closely with this person, uh, I still may have the things I'm concerned about, you know, and yeah. I'm still frustrated about certain things, but it also allows me to see, oh yeah, this is actually a really great person capable in these ways. Like we can work effectively together, uh, even if there's these other things and, and just it's, it's like proximity to difference helps you become more comfortable with difference and yeah. helps you learn how to navigate it better. Uh, yeah. And so I know I personally experienced that and felt that, um, you know, and, and in some cases feel quite embarrassed by like the, the narratives in my head that I was, the things I was telling myself about this person that yeah. really, once I got to know them better, I'm like, no, that, that that's really not where they were coming from or what they were trying to do. Um, and, and uh, finally, you know, I was able to kind of have my eyes open to that. Yeah. Uh, yes. You're, you're spot on. I'm, I'm, what happens with people, it was, it's interesting. I was actually teaching a workshop last week and um, they were, you know, you talk about the power dynamic piece in there. And someone was saying like, well, what if someone, you know, what if, what do I do? How do I start the process? If that person may be junior to me, if that person may be not quite at my level, um, but I see it and I, you know, how do we do that? And, and what I recommend to folks in that situation is, Sometimes addressing the conflict mm. first isn't the way to go about it. Sometimes extending an olive branch, having a coffee, you know, trying to build a little bit of rapport outside the situation. And that's kind of what, you know, you were, you, you triggered that memory there because of what you just said is sometimes you just got to get to know the person and then you can actually surface the issue that may be there. Uh, and and what I find oftentimes is that people are afraid to surface what they are perceiving as frustration or conflict. They're afraid because they don't feel skilled to do it. They don't know what will happen. Mm -hmm. And they're afraid to make things worse. Not doing anything will almost guarantees that it'll get worse. 
but figuring out how to safely surface the issue, which is sometimes as simple as, I wonder if you've been thinking about this it seems like we're coming at this problem from different angles. Do you want to talk about it? Mm. You know, think just taking a moment to think about how could I, how could I bring this up? How could I surface this issue in a way that was neutral to this person? And we, we did, a, I had, like I said, I was doing a workshop last week and it, it, there was a lot of things kind of bubbling up around a topic and it just seemed like, the right time to have a surfacing exercise. And so we did, and, and there was probably about, you know, 25 people in the room. And we said, you know, have a fictitious conversation, practice surfacing something. And every one of the groups was like, I actually did something real. I actually had a frustration and I surfaced it. And it was actually easy. And now we've actually figured it out. And, and I think that I bring that up because when, when there is conflict on a team, a lot of times it can be resolved pretty easily, a lot more easily than people feel like it could be simply by surfacing the issue. Yeah. And, and you mentioned it a few minutes ago, just doing nothing, uh, allowing the resentments to build the frustrations to build, you know, passive aggressive behaviors, whatever, like just doing nothing doesn't help. It, it's just yeah. going to make things worse in the long, long run. So you may think that you're avoiding, you know, something that's going to be uncomfortable or, or, blow things up and, and maybe it will, but yeah. you know, you're better off facing it than, than pretending, you know, putting your head in the sand and pretending like it's not there. And the one last thing I just wanted to say yeah. is, is just acknowledging that yes, there are people that have bad intentions, nefarious intentions. There are people that, you know, you, you can't just be Pollyanna ish and just assume everyone is going yeah. to um, do this in good faith. But in my experience, the vast majority of people do wake up in the morning wanting to like go and be good to people and work well with people and collaborate. Most people aren't, um, you know, nefarious individuals trying to right. exploit their team or, or whatever, right? So if we can just start from a place of like a, uh, a little bit of benefit trust, of yeah. the benefit of the doubt, be yep. a little generous with people. Um, because I think our human brain kind of automatically tends to jump towards, you know, negative, uh, implications, right. Of, of, mm -hmm. uh, and, and negative interpretation. So we, if we can be aware that that's kind of what tends to pop up, then yeah. we can, we can challenge that. Well, Kimberly, this has been a great conversation. I know at the time and I need to let you go, but before we yeah. wrap things up for today, I wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you, find sure. out more about your work, your team, and then give us the final word on the topic for today. Well, I think the final word on the topic is trust. At the, at the start and at the beginning, building team, a high-performing team and really cultivating, again, you know, watering, nurturing, tilling, pruning, all of those, I uh, loved the, the um, agricultural metaphor there because it's perfect for what it, re what it takes to build a high-performing team. And that starts with trust, trust and intention. And so that's the final word on, on today's topic. Um, and if you're interested, if, you know, anyone who might want to reach out and chat more about this, because there really is so much more ground to cover here. Yes. Um, it, you know, our website is I, the letter I, accelerate, E-X-C-E-L-E-R-A-T-E.com. That's a great place. Lots of, of good resources um, to get in touch with us, but also to download for, for leaders and teams, um, some free resources there. So uh, encourage people to stop by and uh, and to reach out. Wonderful. Kimberly, it's been a pleasure. I encourage the audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Kimberly and her team can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope all right. you all Thank have you, a John. great week. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the podcast. We hope you stay healthy and safe, and please join us again soon.